Daniel. Yay, come on up here. Hey. Here's this. You could be getting this set up. If, oh, you don't have anything. Okay. All right. Well, we just really appreciate Danny. We're so glad we get to have him for week two. How would you like to have him do a conference some all day Sunday or something like that sometime? I think that would be wonderful. But we really appreciate him and all of his knowledge. Uh, he's, like I said, the number one Hebrew scholar in the universe. Yay! Danny, take it away. Maybe in this room. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Um, the Torah portion of today, I can uh, sum it up in one word. Besi no, well, not in one word. But we need some. Can, uh, can you put it a little louder? Um, it's filled with contradictions, many contradictions but many promises, ample promises and ample contradictions and an amazing play of words in Hebrew. And one of the subjects here will be, you know, what Pastor Mark is doing for many, many years. And one of these, uh, I would say, marks of his teaching is astronomy. And astronomy, astronomy and the way it relates to events in the Bible in current days and in coming days. That is his expertise. So I do have a riddle for you. I did not, deliberately I did not tell you that in, in advance. Uh, it's hidden in the Hebrew and uh, we'll hope that you'll find an answer for that. I don't have an answer. It's one of those strange, st very strange, but let's get there. So we're gonna <laughs> what we're gonna do um, it's a very long Torah portion this week, you know, Lech Lecha. And I'll go over that story because I'm sure that some people did not read it in advance and it's okay to tell the story. This is really the, the idea of the Torah portion. We remind ourselves what is in that particular portion of the Bible. Okay, so it starts with Genesis 12 and you do have um, the sheets that I, and I mark some things in blue. I'm going to stress those, but I'm going to read the whole thing, okay? So Abraham, and God said to Abraham, Lech Lecha. But in English, he said to him, and he said to him, to, not Abraham, I should say Abram. His name is Abram at that stage. Say, uh, get out from your country, okay? But in Hebrew, it again, that word that we mentioned it last week, if you heard me, he says, Lech Lecha. Now, what is the meaning of that Lecha? Lech is go. And then there is an extra word. It says lecha. Lecha means to yourself. The, if, we, if you heard last week what we said, the word lecha, when you add it to a command, to an imperative, it has a soothing, comforting, and reassuring effect. Think, the man is very old. Abraham is very old at the time, right? He's close to the age of 100. And suddenly... Oh, 75, sorry. And suddenly, well, it's pretty close, you know. <laughs> uh, he's 75. And suddenly, in that age, God tells him, all right, you're ready for the beginning of your life. Well, take your stuff and go to the land. This is very difficult and to any man, you know. And then God says to him, lech lecha. But unlike in the English, it's like laying a hand on his shoulder and telling him, trust in a way, by the lecha, soothing him and say, go, kind of trust me. Okay, and to the, but also the principle that we call make no mistake. It appears several times in the Bible when a great of great magnitude request comes up from God towards a person. He makes no mistakes that the person understands. Like in the story of uh, the sacrifice later on, he said, take your son, later on, in a different Torah portion, take your son, okay, he has only one, the only one, I got it, the one that you love, I got it, take Isaac, fourfold, make no mistake, and look what happens here, go from your country, I'm doing an impromptu translation, I'm not reading the English, from your homeland, I got it, I have, you know, from the house of your father, Make sure that you don't misinterpret what I'm asking you and go to the land that I'll show you. And I'll make you a great nation and I'll bless you, 
ואגד לך שמך ואהיה ברכה, and you be blessed. And I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you, and the rest of the families of the earth will be blessed in you. And Abram left as he told him, and Lot goes with him. You remember Lot is the son of his brother, right? And um, Abraham was 75 years and he, when he left Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, her name is Sarai, his wife, and Lot, which is the son of his brother, and all their property that they made, and all the souls, when they say souls, they mean in that time slaves and servants and so on. These are the souls that they made in Haran, and they are about to embark on their way to the land of Canaan, and they came to the land of Canaan. Remember Canaan? From last time, it's, uh, it was, the name itself, Canaan, is not a positive name. It means, you know, the, the people of Canaan, it means to surrender. You know, that's what happened to, the, to Canaan, which is the son of Ham, and he will surrender, and he will be submissive. But still, it's a land of, you know, with people there, he goes. And Abraham goes in this land until the, up to the place called Shechem. And, the, you know, this is a, it's in the West Bank, Shechem is what today, later on, the Greek called it, or the Romans called it, Nablus, you know. And I'm sure your pastor is taking people to that uh, place there, right? And, uh, and that place is a very important one. It has two mountains, one on the east of the city and one in the west, or oh, south, right, south and north, right? And one of them is the Mount of Blessing, and the, uh, the other one is the Mount of Curse, in, surrounding the city of Shechem, very important place. Up to Alon Moreh, and once again, he mentioning, and the Canaanite are still in the, are that time on the land. And, Abra and God saw Abraham and he says, and here is promise number one. First of all, he told him, go to your way, embark, and you know, and to the land I will show you. But now what's going on? And God says to him, to your seeds I will give this land. And he builds a shrine there to, for God who is seen to him, right? Who, who appears to him. So Abraham sees God. I think it's the first time he sees God, right? This is the first time there is an appearance of the Lord to anyone that we know, right? He did, he, Noah did not see him, right? I don't think that Noah saw God. He talked to him, but he didn't see him. Okay, so God appears to Abraham, and he tells him the promise, I'm going to give it to your seeds. Now, this is the, a very important statement. This is the connection between the Jewish people up until today to the land. But, you know, it also falls into what the, you know, the other sons of Abraham are claiming, you know. And this is the strife. This is really, I mean, they also claim the land. But, well, you will see later on, the promise is to what side of Abraham, to what seed of Abraham the promise is going. And he kind of moves away from there to the mountain, uh, east, east of uh, Bethel, Bethel, and he put its tent between, between Bethel and from the west, and the eye from the east, and he builds a shrine there, and he calls in the name of God, B'Shem Elohim. What name he's calling, we can guess, but that's what it says. He calls in the name of God. And he still doesn't stop there. He goes and, uh, further, and he goes to Negba. Negba means to the south, and that's the name in the Bible to say south. They call it Negev. This is where the big attack of Hamas happened, in the Negev. They're really devastated. So he goes there to the Negev. And there was a big, huge famine. And there was a, yeah, there was a huge famine, a famine in the land. And Abraham went down. Now, here it is. When you go south, you are going downwards. You know, north is positive. And well, ascending, going north is ascending. How did they know that north is ascending and south is descending? Well, did they have a picture of the earth and they know this is going up and this is going down? But here it is. Vayered Avraham Mitzrayma. And Abraham went down to Egypt. Right? What does it say in the Bible? And Abraham went down to Egypt, right? Okay. Because there was a great famine, famine in the land. All right. And, and it, it came to pass, and we get close to Egypt, and, he's, and here is Sarah, his wife, and he said to her, oh, wow, you know, look, I know that you're a very beautiful woman. It's kind of an embarrassing whole story here. He tells her, I know that you're a very beautiful woman, 
how old is Sarah at the time? Sarai at the time. And well, if the Egyptian will see you and they said, well, that's his wife and they will kill me and they will keep you, all right? Because of your beauty. Apparently, it's not invented in Hollywood, that beauty and the power of the beauty and what to use of that. Um, well, they're going to kill me if they think I'm your husband and they will take you. So say, please, look at that. I beg you, he says. <laughs> Okay, I beg you, Imri na. Now here, the na, like, unlike in many other places in the Bible that is missing, it's translated. He said, I beg you. And he's saying, please say that you are my sister so that it will be my favor and my soul will be saved because of you, because you're my sister. And as Abraham came to Egypt and the Egyptian saw that woman is very pretty and the, the, the minister or the princess of Pharaoh saw her, and they praised her, and they brought her to Pharaoh, and he was taking her as a wife, you know, and, and the woman was taken to the house of Pharaoh. And Abraham, of course, got, got benefit because of that, and he got uh, sheep, and donkeys, and slaves, and concubines, and, and, mid and mid servants, and much more. But then God is now punishing Pharaoh with great uh, inflictions because of what he is doing. You know? And how does he know that it's happening because of that? How did he know? Because the next thing we see, and, Abra and, and Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that you have done to me? <laughs> Why did you not tell me that, uh, that you was your wife? Well, how did he know that this all punishment is coming from that? We don't know, right? It's kind of a mystery. But he knew. And he said, Why did you say my sister, he, she? And I will take her as a wife. And now, here is your wife. Kach velech. And it's like, take and go. It's clear cut, you know. And the English says, um, take her and go your way. But it, it's very concise in Hebrew. You know, like seven words, six words here. And it says, kach velech. Again, the word lech in a different connotation. Okay? The, the first verse in the Bible, in, the, in this chapter, starting with lech. Lecha, go in a very soothing way, right? When God speaks to him, go. I mean, uh, go. Lech lecha, to the land I'll show you. And here the word, which is in the very last, almost the very last sentence of that chapter, it says, kach velech, lech, take and go. No soothing, no nothing. No, get me out of my trouble. I don't need that. Take your, get out of here, you know. Okay, and uh, Pharaoh puts pe people on him and they send him and his wife and everything that he had. So they did not take the fringe benefits that he got there for being only supposedly the brother. They gave him all, the, they left him with all the property. Now I need to tell you something about property. The word property in Hebrew is very related, <laughs> you know, you'll think how different we are today. The word rich in the Bible, you know what it is, by the way? Anybody knows what the word rich in the Bible? It's not a sheer. It is what? It is kaved, heavy. Heavy. Heavy with what? Not heavy set with big bellies, no. Heavy with gold and treasures and property and people, slave and so on. Heavy. And the word, that's kaved. That's heavy or rich. And what's the word for honor or dignity or respect? Kavod. It's almost the same word. So honor in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, is the same thing as rich, you know. <laughs> so uh, we didn't go that far away from that, you know. I mean, it, well, we can understand it. There is something fake in this whole idea. But little, very little was changed in our perspective as a society since that time. All right, and Abraham, chapter 13, and Abraham came up. Now look at that. And Abraham went up from Egypt. Before that, he went down to Egypt, to the south. Now he's going up from Egypt, going north. How, again, how did they know? And why did they decide that going up is going north and going down is going south? You know, look at, <laughs> this is very strange. Not in every case, but I did read here a research, you know. It is true in every town in America. Oh, not in every, but in many. And in other places too. The South 
you know, parts south of, the ta- of towns tend to be less mm, advanced and less modernized and less rich, heavy than north, you know. I mean, look, even Tel Aviv. Look, north Tel Aviv is sort of the intelligentsia, you know. And then the south is different. South is the Negev. I mean, people that are more inflicted, more in trouble, more in that. And it's true in many cities, you know, the south part of the town. You know, I don't know what's the reason for that, but it, it just, like, more than one case. It, it doesn't mean that it, every city is the same, but check it out. You know, south is tend to be something lower and lesser. And here it is. He goes up to the north and goes down to the south. Again, there is a connotative meaning behind going up and going down. We understand it. But this is not the big surprise I'm preparing here for you and for Pastor Mark that is going to be put on the spot. And uh, <laughs> I asked him, is that okay? So, oh, I don't mind. I love challenges. Well, we're going to show you. And uh, I'm sure you're going to have an answer for that. But I did not. I couldn't find it. But that's why I need you. So, and Abraham, now look, here is a verse. It's highlighted in blue in your book, in your paper. And Abraham was very rich in cattle. And in Hebrew, and Abraham was very heavy in ke- kaved, right? Kaved, bemikne, in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Heavy, and remember, heavy is also means honorable. And Abraham was in the, Abraham, at that time, Abraham was honorable. And he go to his traveling, and I'm doing it again, impromptu, impromptu translation, so it not be word for word for the English. I'm doing it faster this way. And he goes from the Negev, which is the south, to the place of Bethel, which is northeast of there, to the place that he was in the beginning, between Bethel and the Ai. Okay? Um, to the place, and then it says hi in English, hey, and hey, but it's not hey, it's I, I actually in Hebrew, I. Don't try it. Don't try it at home. Okay. El Mekoma Mizbeach, to the place of the shrine or the altar that he made in the beginning, and he calls Vaikrasham Avraham, and once again, Abraham calls there in the name of God. He is calling to the Father. And the, the connection between Abraham, the father of the Hebrew nation, on the Jewish nation, is tightening in this very, very day, in this very chapter. And also the Lot, the Gamble Lot, and, and, but also Lot that is going with Abraham, his uh, nephew, right? Um, his brother's son, was also a lot of property. You know, you remember, he went to the mid Egypt. But the land, look at that, but the land was not able to bear them. And the word here in Hebrew is nasa. Nasa is it's bare, but it means also to lift up. The land could not lift them up together, so they could not really walk on the land together. You know, you get the image here um, to sit together because their property was very big and they could not stay together. Property was very large and they could not stay together. You under, of course you understand, right? I mean, look. I mean, when there are too much property and there is competition, look what happens even in big, I mean, can the land carry both America, U.S., and China? When China became that rich, the land cannot, cannot. Evidently, it's going to be a clash because the land cannot carry two great powers in property together. And when it's a weaker country, it can carry because one is strong, the other one is not strong. But here it is. Well, they say, well, okay, let's separate. And there was a fight between the, the shepherds of Abraham and the shepherds of Lot. And, and here it is a reminder who is there in the land. The Knani, the Canaanite, and the Prezis are dwelling there in the land. Okay, and Abraham said to Lot, let's not have a fight between you and my shepherds and your shepherd because we are brothers. So let's separate from me. If I go to the right, to the left, and if you go to the left, I'll go to the right, and if I go to the right, you go to the left. And Lot co- carried his eyes to the Kikara Yarden, which is the valley of the Jordan, right? And Kikula Mashke, because it was all filled with water, to flourishing. Now that area today, just next to the Jordan, is, but the whole area there, which is kind of surprising, because he went to the city of Sedom, right? Sedom, and you can see it in the verse. I mean, I highlighted Sedom and Gamora, Gamora in English. Um, 
And okay, so he goes to that area. You, we know it's desolate, completely desolate today. It's, it's desert. It looks almost like the face of the earth at creation, right after creation. Very desolate. And we, we see a contradiction here. Well, I'll show you the contradiction. So first, it says, oh, it's all water. It's all great and, and, uh, and fruitile, right? He, he wants that. And he says, I'm taking that. Okay, and and that was before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah as the garden of God in the land of Egypt, Boachat Tzoar, come to Tzoar. Okay, so this is a very fruitful land. He chooses this one. He chooses that one. And Lot chose the, um, and Lot chose the, the Kikarir then himself, the valley of the Jordan, and he goes there and they travel there and they separate it from one another, from each other, from each from his brother, it says. And Abraham sat in the set or lived in the land of Canaan and to the cities of the Kikar of the plain. And he, and he um, uh, had the tents up to Sedom, but not in Sedom, up to that place. And the people of Sedom are very bad, are very evil, right? Exceedingly wicked. And they are sinners before the Lord. And God said to Abraham, after he separated from Lot, lift up your eyes. Look, again, sa na. The word is please. Look, what, what the English says. And after separating from him, lift up now your eyes. You see, they translate the word now wrongly throughout the Bible. Hundreds of times when the word in Hebrew is na. I didn't highlight that, but you don't have it there. But it's in verse 14. And it says, lift up. What is that? Um, yeah, sana enecha in verse 14, and it says, lift up your eyes. But in English, it says, now lift up your eyes. It doesn't say now. It said, please, he's begging him, please lift up your eyes and see that place um, what you are, where, where you are, to the, to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west, okay? Because, and here is promise number two, second time the promise. And he says, because all this land that you see to you will be given and to your seeds until the end of days. Not until one time it will end in history, in the future, but to the end of days. Ad olam means to the forever, right? And again, the promise gets deeper. And he says, and I shall make your seed as the dust of the earth, I mean, a lot, right? Each one is individual. So that if a man can count the dust of the earth, then shall your seed also be counted. And then is the next verse is a great song in Hebrew. It's a great song. And it says, After arise and walk, arise, walk through the land in its length and in its breadth, for I will give it to you. It's a great song in Hebrew. Search it on YouTube. Kum v'italech. Put, put these words and find it out. It's a gorgeous song. Kum Yoram Gaon. Ga, Yehoram Gaon sings it. But many others too. Okay. Um, next verse. And this is the end of uh, chapter 13. And Abraham put the tents and he sits in Aloneh Mamre, which is in Hebron. Right? And he builds there a shrine for God. This is another place that he builds a shrine. And we are in chapter 14 of Genesis. And it came to pass, or it, yeah, it came to pass at the time of Aramphel, um, Amraphel, the king of Shinar, Aryoch, the king of Elsar, and Kedar Laomer, the king of Elam, and Tidal, who is the king of nations. Tidal was the king of nations. But it's really not nations, we think that when it says Melech Goim, because each one of them is the king, and then comes the place, Goim just not necessarily means nations. It means a name called Goim, you know, that called nation. Now look at the next verse. Verse 2 in highlighted there. It says, Asu milchama, okay, that this made war was Bera, Melech Sdom, ve'et Birsha, Melech Amora, and oh, I'm reading Hebrew to you, I'm sorry. Uh, with the Be Bera, king of Sedom, and with Birsha, king of Gomorrah. Now stop for a second in those two names. Remember last time we said names in the Bible are not coincidental. They have a meaning. 
when you look at the king of Sedom, look at its name, Bera. Well, in English, it means nothing to you, right? It says B-E-R-A. But Ra in Hebrew means wicked, evil, right? So the king of Sedom is already called wicked, evil. <laughs> but what's the name of the king of Amora, which is the two places that God destroyed? Birsha, and that's Rasha, wicked. The word of the king of Amora is also means wicked, like word for word. Bet in the beginning and then Rasha. Rasha means wicked. So his name is wicked. And so Shinav, the king of Adma, and Shamever, the king of Tzvoim, and the, and the king of Bela, you know, Bela, which is Tzohar. Bela also, you know, to mean in Hebrew to speak evil. If you remember, we mentioned it last time and before, Be Bela is the part of the name of Balaam, you know, the one that was hired to curse Israel. And Bela means to speak evil. Look how much evil just in the name in one verse. It, isn't that amazing? I mean, all had the meaning of evil, bad, and so on, you know. All this joined together, all these joined forces together in the valley of Sidim, which is the Dead Sea. Now we get that. Oh, not yet. Okay. So the Dead Sea, and that's more or less the area that Lot has chosen, right? Sedom is in the, very close to the Dead Sea, right there. So all this, and now 12 years they served, they served Kedar Laomer, and 13 years, and the 13 years they, they um, revolted in him. Okay, probably on the 13th year, they revolted, right? Not, well, in the way it is, like in 13 years, the revolt took place. But probably on the 13 years, they revolted, right? Okay, look at the next verse. shana, and in the 14th year, so we get that, right? On the 14th year came Kedar Omer and the kings that are with him. Look what they are doing here. And they... And defeated, well, yeah, defeated who? The Rephaim in Ashtoreth, in Ashtoreth, in Ashtoreth Karnaim, and the Zuzim, and in Ham, in Ham, okay, Beham, and the Aimim in Shave Kiryatim. Now, all of these are the names that really started as the sons of God. These are the, the Nephilim in their various names. There is one more that is not here in other places in the Bible called Zamzumim. Bzz, you hear that? Zzz, buzzing. Zamzumim sounds like the word buzzing. So who are those names? You know, Rephaim in today's Hebrew and also in old Hebrew means like almost like ghosts. Okay, Rephaim. Like when you see a phantom it's called in Hebrew, Ruach Rephaim, the spirit of phantom, you know? And they, okay, but there are people at the time, and we know they inhibited the land. But how could they inhibit the land, you know? What happened there when they, much before the flood, right? They married the daughter of man, and da 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 But then God destroyed everyone on the earth, right? Except for Noah. So how... On earth, literally, they are there again on earth if they are all supposed to be destroyed. Was it another visit or some kind of a journey that they made from wherever they came from? But they are in the land. We can see that they are right now. They are in the land. We don't know, but they are here. Okay. This is verse 6. Uh, which El Padan, which is on the desert. And they sat and they came to the Ein Mishpat, Ein Mishpat means the, the, the spring of judgment, which is Kadesh, you know, this is really in the south. And they hit the, all the field of Amal, Amalek and Amorite that is sitting in Hatzatzon Tamar. Okay, let's go on. I, I don't want to spend too much time on that because I'm rushing with the time. Okay, but now look. And the king of Sedom and the king of Amora, remember those are two evil names, right? And the king of Adma, the king of Tzoim, and the king of Bela, which is Tzoar, and they, what? And they rage, I mean, and they, what? Joined the battle. And they had, a, uh, you know, joined them in battle in the valley of Sidim. 
and this is the Dead Sea. At Kedar Laomer, so who they are fighting? They are fighting Kedar Laomer, right? They fight Kedar Laomer, the king of Elam and Tidal, and the king of Goim, the king of nations, whatever, and Aram, uh, Amraphel, the king of Shinar, and Aryoch, king of El Sar, four kings, the five, okay? So there is a war here between the king of uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and those, Kedar Laomer, which is a very powerful king, right? This is a big war. And uh, now here is a description, which is kind of interesting, because first it was like a very fruitful land. Mark me if... Uh, oh, and the land of Sidim is Be'erot Be'erot. It says the, the land of Sidim is full of uh, slime pits, which is really clay. Uh, what you see today in the area of the Dead Sea, all kind of uh, sulfur. Oh, well, but... If that was all fruitful and stuff, how does it go along with what really we thought that happening only after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, kind of a nuclear event that took place there at the destruction? But anyway, um, and the, so what happens there? And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, right? Right? They fled. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. Okay, so they were defeated according to this, right? And fell there. And those who are left are running to the mountains, to the mountain. And they took all the property of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, right? And, and, their, and all their provisions, right? The food. And they went. Who did? Who did? Kedar Laomer and the other kings, right? They defeated them. Whomever was left ran to the mountains, probably the Samaria mountain, but apparently not. Later on, it's really way in the north. It's the Golan Heights, all the way. And they left, and they took Lot, while well, he is now a refugee, he's a abducted, right? And they took Lot and, Lot and his property, the son of uh, the brother of Abraham, and, he, and they went, and he is, he is, or he was, okay? And he's good, okay, what? And he, who lived in Sodom. So past then, who lived in Sodom, they took him away. And the refugee, and, who is the Palit, and there came one who had escaped. Yeah, the Palit in Hebrew means refugee. Uh, came to Abram, the, the Hebrew Abram. Op, 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 Hebrew Abram. Now it's Hebrew. Now they are already describing him as the Hebrew man. We didn't hear that before. I think this is the first time, again, that that word is mentioned. Right, Pastor? It's the first time, right? So now he is the Hebrew man, Hebrew Abraham, and he's under name Amre. The, okay, well, I'm skipping up. And Abraham heard that his brother has been, his brother was taken captive. It's not his brother. Lot is the son of his brother. He's his nephew, right? But he says his brother. And he armed his trained servants, you know, and he goes there and he chased them up to Dan. You know where is Dan? It's way, way north. It's on the border of Syria and Lebanon, top of Israel. Um, okay, so he goes there, and, he, and then he pursued them all the way to Chova, which is left of Damascus, left of Damascus, way up in the Golan, beyond the Golan Heights, you know, beyond there. This is a big part of the land there this war is taking place. And he returned in verse uh, 16. He returned all the property and also Lot, also returned Lot and his property. And he returned the women and the, and the wives and the, and the people. And the king, now look at this. And the king of Sodom, come, Sodom came towards him. Wait a second. Wasn't he defeated, the king of Sodom, just a minute ago? Right? We heard that he was defeated. And the king, yeah, he was. And the king of Sodom comes towards him after... Yeah, after Abraham defeated Kedar Laomer and the king that was him to the valley, you know, Al Emek Shave, which is the king of the, uh, uh, the valley of the king. And Malkitzedek, this is the first time we hear of Malkitzedek, right? And also not an accidental name. Malkitzedek means the king of righteousness, my king of righteousness. And a very important word comes up for the first time, connecting Israel, the people of Israel, the Hebrew. Look, a lot of things are hidden, and not hidden, but they're inserted in this chapter 
that are dramatically connecting Israel to its land and to its internal capital, the dwelling place of the Lord. Look at this. Melchizedek is the king, now pay attention, of Shalem. You know what is Shalem? That's Jerusalem. That's the early names, but it's really Shalem and Yerushalem. You hear that? Jerusalem. So that Melchizedek is now, he is the king of Shalem, of what is later on to be Jerusalem. And he is the priest to whom? To the Most High God. How many of them do we know? He is the priest for the, high, the Most High God. Now, and he blessed him. Who blessed whom? It says, and he blessed him. <laughs> he is, who is he? Who is him? What? Right. Well, we still have to guess, right? He blessed him. And he said, but we know by the next word, and he said, blessed is, blessed be Abraham. So who is talking here? Malkitzedek, right? He said, blessed be Abraham, Abraham, sorry, Abraham to the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Okay, describing God. And in verse 20, and blessed be God, the Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tenth of all. Now, who gives the tenth here of all? Who is he and who is him? What do you understand from that? And he gave him a tenth of all. It sounds like Melchizedek is giving Abraham a tenth of all, right? Doesn't it sound like that? How can we tell who gave whom, you know? It, even in Hebrew, you can't tell, you know? It, it, you know? I'll give him, and he gives him a tenth of all. What makes sense here? Who, who gives the tenth? I mean, he blesses him, he does the big thing of him, but who does? Who does? Who is giving the tenth of all? Abraham to Melchizedek. Why do we really think that Abraham gave that to Melchizedek? It's a, it's a question. You can't, yes, right, right. He, he does, right? But he doesn't say it in Hebrew. He, he could have said in Abraham, in Abraham tied him, no? But he says, he, who is speaking here all the time? And Baruch, and blessed is the God of the Most High who has delivered the enemies, your enemies into your hand. And it sounds by the context that Malchizedek tithing Abraham and not the other way around. Because there is a context here. He talks, he blesses, and then that. And he gave him, if there was a comma there instead of a period, it was very obvious. But this is English. And in Hebrew, there is no commas and no periods. So he said, and blessed the Lord, and he gave him. To me, it sounds that Balkitzedek gave Abraham the tithing and not the other way around. And I know I'm saying something here that contradicts a lot of teachings. I mean, I know, but I go by the context here, you know. Kind of peculiar, agree? It's a little peculiar. I mean, we want to believe, but look, um, if we take for granted everything that we've ever been taught, you know, and we don't ever challenge ourselves to think for a second and go clear, clearly by the text, we are in trouble. You know, we got to think. So I might be wrong, but by the context here, it sounds the other way around. But it makes, then it makes Abraham much greater. We need to take a break here. I'll continue that. And we have something pretty fascinating that has to do with El Shaddai and why El Shaddai is called El Shaddai. Something that you did not think about if you did not read that page that we have there. But we're taking a break here and uh, we'll come back. Okay, bye. All right. Uh, let's pray. Avino Malkeinu, our Father King, we just thank you so much for your word. We pray that uh, all of the seed of your word falls on good soil, good ground. May none of our hearts be rocky or, or thorny, full of weeds. Father, I just pray right now that the, the word that Danny taught uh, through you would have a great impact on all of our lives, uh, that we 
wouldn't go away unchanged. I just pray that uh, all of our lives would be changed in some way. We'd go away as different people. Father, I thank you for all those uh, who are live streaming, all those uh, from around the world, around the United States, that we just pray a blessing upon them and all those who are here locally. Father, we all want to be a light to the nation. We all want to participate. We all want to be able to cast our crowns at your feet, showing uh, how we fulfilled your word, not our own word, not our own thoughts, our own feelings, but, uh, Father, how we enhanced your kingdom in this world. So, Father, I thank you for all those who uh, give uh, locally around the world to take your light of your Torah to all the nations. We just thank you in your name together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. <clears throat> I want to say one word. <clears throat> People talk to me during the break here, and Pastor is saying about this war against Amalek. But the biggest, war, it's a big war, but there is another one taking place right here at the very liberal views of many people. You know, I saw an advertisement today, a small little thing, and it's a mother reprimanding her daughter for lying a lot. And she kind of puts a finger and said, stop lying so much. You'll grow up to be a BBC reporter. You got to stop it, you know. <laughs> Misinformation, disinformation, distorted, distortion. And all that is hiding under so-called human rights and appropriate behavior and balance and all other nonsense and lies Underneath them, there is a clear-cut word that we don't like to use, but it is sometimes in a very, very small scale is gullible and innocence. Mostly, it's hidden roots of anti-Semitism, the hatred of Jewish people. The first new wave of anti-Semitism became, well, they can't say after the Holocaust, you know, the first Holocaust, they can't say anything against Jews because it's considered to be politically incorrect. So what do they do? They pick up Israel for years and blinding their, themselves to see really what's happening there. And this is the new way of anti-Semitism. So they are supposedly politically correct. They're only against Israel, not against Jews. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's a different dress of anti-Semitism need to be completely rooted out from the minds of people. A lot of, a lot of information needs to be correct. And I'm very proud, and I know, I don't know what's your political view, but I'm very proud of the stance United States taking, and I hear uh, Kirby and other people here in the US, how did they answer the hypocrite reporters, even in this very country, and by giving them the facts, say, what is evil? And he stressed out what is evil. And that's very important to stand up and look at it, the organization that U.S. pay 80% of its budget called the United Nations. 120 countries yesterday decide to, uh, in the General Assembly, you know, to denounce Israel for what they're doing to the poor Palestinians. And 120 countries. And who are those? We need to mock those, you know. Those are the, really the enemies of God, if you believe in God because not mentioning even one word of the atrocities and the Holocaust, I mean, even worse, Holocaust, actually the Holocaust is the wrong term. You know, Holocaust is the sacrifice that is desired by God. So the word is Shoah. Do not use the word Holocaust, you know. Holocaust is the Greek word of Holocaustus, which is a sacrifice that is desired by God. And the Holocaust, what happened with the Nazis in Germany and with Hamas and its supporters, in uh, October 7th in Israel is not a Holocaust, it's a Shoah. It's a greater word than just Holocaust. But uh, you came here for a purpose here. I had to say what is in my heart and let's continue. And I try to move to a more cheering mode. Mm, it's hard. Believe me, it's hard in the last three weeks. I'm sleepless. Um, 
All right, so we do see duality in sentences. We do see two ways to look at things. And we don't know for, sh for sure, because if people are very sure about what they think, this is the area where we fall, we can fall into mistakes. I'm not saying that what I said before is indeed my view, okay? It's not necessarily. But I'm just reading it as a narrative, as a something like the, the way it is written, Malkitzedek is talking, and he blesses Abraham, and he says, uh, blessed is the El Elyon, blessed is the, the high, um, the most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He's talking to Abraham, and he gave him a tenth of all. Who is he? And when you say end, it continues with the same subject. It's Malkitzedek. Looks more likely to, but it doesn't make sense, right? Because why does it make sense? Because we've been teaching it for thousands of years that Malkitzedek, Abraham is giving ties to Malkitzedek. But when you look at the narrative, it says, and he gave him, and so continuing to what he is blessing him, and he gave him. To me, it looks like Malkitzedek, but who am I? I'm, you know, this is like the way it looks in the Hebrew, but in English too. Gave him that. Now, what? Who is the big shot in this story? You know, I mean, of course, in theology, Christian theology, and later on, Malkitzdek is the big shot, right? Some people even comparing to Jesus himself, right? You heard that. But who is the big shot in this whole story here? It's actually Abraham. Malkitzdek is a priest, a priest of the Most High, but he's a priest. He's an ordinary man, but he's a, but he's a high priest, okay? There are many high priests in the Bible. But the big shot, in a way, is Abraham here. This is what God has chosen the first time. This is the chosen. The land will be yours, and he's called the Hebrew. And the big promise of God is falling into part here. So it is not completely out of possibility that the high priest is tithing Abraham. It's not. Because look at the image, Abram at the time. Okay, Abram. Okay, let's go on. Okay, and he, he still blessed. Okay, so. And then uh, verse 21. The king of Sodom says to Abram, give me the souls, right? It says give me the persons, but in Hebrew, give me the souls. And take the property. Now, Abraham went to a war at which, at which the king of Sodom was defeated, right? So they took their looting. They took their property and they took their souls, the, the people, right? Their people. And he says, but he's a defeated man coming to Abraham. He says, give me the souls. Give me the people, the souls. But you know how sinister it is. The souls to the king of evil is coming to ask for Abraham so he can destroy those souls, you know? But he said, I don't care about the property. Keep the property. Give me the souls, the people. And Abraham, Abraham said, Abram said to the king of Psalm, I raise my hand to the God, to God El Elyon, the owner of the earth and the, and the, and the land, that I'm not going to take anything from your property, lest you will say that you made me rich. I don't need you to make me rich with the property. Okay, so I don't need any of this. He says, take. I want to take only what the, chi the, the boys, you know, the, the men. Here it says the young, the youth, you know, the fighters, you know, has taken, have eaten anything that had to do with their food. And they came with me. Um, to the, they, they take their part. The people of Aner and Eshkol, those people that came and fought, they can take part of the, of the property, but not me. I don't need you to make me rich. This is a very strong statement of a man that is God choosing here, and it shows a very interesting moral principle. You know, the looting and all that, it's your people. You know, you don't make me rich. I don't need you to make me rich, the king of evil. All right, uh, uh, chapter 15. After this thing, the word of God said to Abraham in a vision, and again promises, do not be afraid, Abram. I am protecting you, and I will reward, your reward will be very great. And Abram said, God, 
What would you give me? And I'm, you know, and I was asking. And I'm going, and I'm alone. I have, chil- I have no children and so on. And Abraham says, but you didn't give me a seed. And here is somebody that works for me. He's going to inherit me. And God says, no, this is not going to inherit you, but the one that will come out from your loins, right? And, and he took him outside. Here's a test, the first t- test he's doing. He takes him outside, and it's probably evening time, night time, right? And he says, look to the sky, look toward the heaven, right? Ashamaima, and count the stars. If you can count them, if you can count them, and he said to him, and so will be the number, and so is the number of your seed. Before that was the sand, remember? Going to the earth, he said the sand. And you can count the sand, that's how the number of your seed will be. And now go and count the, sky, the, the stars, and that will be your seed. But here is some kind of an, a um, problematic line. Verse 6. And he believed in the Lord. Okay? Abraham believed in the Lord. So, the promise is your, your seed will be so multiplied and all that. Yes, great. And he believed in the Lord. And he, ca- and he counted it to him for righteousness. And that's God, right? God say, okay, he believes in me. I tell him that he is a righteous man. And God says... And he said to him, he is God, right? He said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Cassadians to, the, to give you the land to inherit it once again and again and again and again. The land, you see it, that. But whoop, what happened to Abraham that believed in God a second ago? Now he doesn't believe. And he says, hmm, and he said, Lord God, how should I know that, <laughs> that I should inherit it? A minute ago, you believed it and you were considered righteous. Now you're doubting God? I mean, give me a sign. Well, I like that, but you know, I need a proof. Can I see a positive ID or something? You know, what is it asking? He needs a proof? <laughs> he does, right? He's challenging the Lord. So the process of being righteous here is not a clear cut one second. And that's it, right? He has a challenge. He's doubting, Right? Okay, and then there's a test. Take, um, bring me, you know, three-year-old heifer and all that, and he take them and he cut them and the birds. And I'm going, I'm skipping on, but here comes the sub- subject. I, I had to tell Pastor Mark that at the break, you know, I, I think our microphone was open, <laughs> and people in some Cayman Island <laughs> responded that they can hear the discussion here. So don't get bored if you didn't hear that. We <laughs> so, um, look at this. Now, this is very, 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 to say the least, peculiar. Your English will not show that. Your English says, and when the sun was going down, sweet, the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a fear of great darkness fell upon him. No problem in the English, a big problem in the Hebrew. This is not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, Vayehi Hashemesh Lavo. And when the sun comes, now wait, 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 wait. We need to think of today and at the people at the time. And I'm not talking about just the flat earthers, you know. We are on the earth, okay? Forget about the flat earth or not. But just our, think of your frame of reference. Okay, you're standing and, you know, it's early, it, it, it's 3 a.m. and you're patient and you're waiting. And what comes suddenly at 6 o'clock or 7, depends on the season, what? The sun. The sun does what? Comes, right? It comes. Now, we all know from what direction it comes. Does it come from the south? No. Does it come from the west? No. Does it come? Well, where is it coming from? From the east. And what is the word east in a, in a common word? Orient, right? You heard of the word orient. And out of the word orient came the word orientation. And what is in the word orient? The Hebrew word or, light. You remember in Genesis 1 and God says, be light? 
And so the Orient received its name from the word Or in Hebrew, which is light. Right? And that light is coming from the East, right? So we, as people, like the biblical time, the sun is coming. We know. We're not going to argue about that, right? The sun comes from the East. But here's the verse says in Hebrew. And when the sun was coming... And a sleep fell on him, and there be big darkness. When the sun was coming, there is darkness? Hmm. So I checked it out to see other places in the Bible. Maybe it's a mistake. Quote, and quote, and quote, and quote. No mistakes in the Bible, right? Quote, and quote, and quote, and quote. So I checked it elsewhere. And look at that in Micah. You don't have it because I just did it this morning. I, I decided, I mean, I knew... That is important. So this morning, before I came here, I checked it. And here it is in Micah 3, 6. And it says, Therefore it shall be night to you without vision, and it shall be dark to you without um, deviations. Right? And the sun shall go down upon the prophets, and the, dark, and the day shall be dark over them. But look at the Hebrew. In Hebrew, and the sun came upon the prophets. Came upon the prophets, okay? So when the sun comes upon, there is darkness. What on earth, literally, astronomically, is going on with the Hebrew language here? Is the Hebrew language is completely wrong and only the English is right? But this is what they're choosing to say here. The sun came upon and there was darkness. Second time. Look again at the one on uh, our verse, you know. And the sun came, and, and it came to pass when the sun came, and a deep fe sleep fell on Abraham, and a darkness, right? It, it, it even more fear of great darkness. So the sun comes and there is darkness. Something is wrong. Where is the frame of reference of whomever described that? That when the sun comes, there is darkness. Where? No, it's not an eclipse, no. But the sun comes and there is darkness. So I thought, well, let's check the New Testament. And I checked the New Testament this morning. And look what I see in Mark 1, verse 32. And that's more explicit language, right? At the end, at the eve, or even, it says even, should be evening, right? And at the even... After the sun did a sun did set, that's English, but in Hebrew, and it is after the coming of the sun. That's more explicit. After the coming, not after no, why why not after the setting of the sun or the going of the sun? Why not after the coming of the sun? You're talking about another 12, 14 hours from the coming of the sun until darkness. Why the usage of the word is after coming of the sun? What's the important? I'll tell you something about sun. You know, every noun in Hebrew is predetermined to be either masculine or feminine. Predetermined. Can't do anything about it by the language. So, um, every noun, you know, you can say it is either female or masculine. Uh, female or um, masculine. But there are a few words, and I'm not going to tell you all of them, but really few, maybe 10 to 15, that act very strange. They are both masculine and feminine. Do some words. And one of them is the word sun. Shemesh is both male and female. How do we know? We see verses in the Bible, in Isaiah and other places, that at times the verb, I mean the, the noun, is described as a female, as a feminine noun. And in other places it is a masculine noun. Uva Shemesh that we see here. And the sun came, ba'a, ending with a he, is a feminine, is a feminine verb, right? Or the verb describing the noun. And in other places, v'zarach ha'shemesh, it's a masculine way, and the sun rose. In, it's, I think it's in Isaiah. So, and you know what? Another word that is both masculine and feminine? You're going to love that one. Ruach. Spirit. Spirit is both male and female. 
okay? Which is kind of a very, very interesting point. Okay, we'll go back to this masculine and feminine thing at the end of this. So check it out, Mark 132. Okay, and Micah 36. Yeah, Micah, Micah 36. That's again, the sun comes and there is darkness. Comes and not goes, but comes. Okay, we're going back to our chapter. So, a big fat, uh, verse 2, right there. Um, and a big f uh, sleep fell on him. And, and he said to Abraham, I want you to know, again, promises, 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 promises. I want you to know, he said to Abraham, I want you to know, for certainty that your seed shall be a stranger in the land, right? I mean, Kigrachai is Chabarat, Lolahem. Okay? I want to know for a certainty that your seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not there. It's not theirs, right? And shall be served them, okay? And they shall afflict from them 400 years. Of course, the reference here is to, is to the ex exile in Egypt, right? Okay. The Gamet Agoyasher and also the, that nation whom, the, whom they shall serve, will I judge? So here is the, the discussion I had with the gentleman there. Even though it thinks that they're going to be really bad in the eyes of God, right? He will let it happen and he will judge it later. Like with Abraham, something very unpleasant. Abraham is lying through his teeth and he is in a way selling his wife, you know? He wants to save his life. So he's saying, oh, well, let's say that you are brothers, and, you know, this way I'll be saved, and I'll get some benefits and all that, and I'll save my life. But he's giving his wife, and she's not going there to the palace of Pharaoh uh, to sing songs, or, you know, she's going there as a wife for Pharaoh. And that's why God is afflicting Pharaoh with punishments, as we read before. So that's something very bad happening, and knowingly, and God is punishing later, but it let it happen. It let it happen. Some people ask about the, the Shoah, what you call, people call Holocaust. How could that happen to the people of Israel? How could many people lost their faith among Israel because of what the Nazis did? And they said, we followed him, we studied, we, we prayed, we kept our heart clean and pure. And then and how could it happen? How could God let something like this happen? We don't know. We can't really judge how the thing's working. But punishment comes. It does, does, God does punish. He lets people do things, but he does punish. Okay. So, um, and he promised him also something that is important in the Bible. He tells him that you will gather, you should go to your father in peace. You should be buried in a good old age. That's a big promise. Okay. And the fourth generation, but the fourth generation, they shall come here again for the iniquity of the uh, Ammonites, you know, of Onemory. Amorites, it says. Here, well, the English says Ammonites, but the Hebrew says Amorites. Okay, verse 17, once again the sun, once again. And in Hebrew, Vaya Shemesh Ba'a. That is very explicit. And here the sun comes. Here the sun comes. And in the English, when the sun went down, but in Hebrew, when the sun comes, and it was dark. Dark. So the sun comes and there is dark. Second time in one chapter, in verse 17, you see that I highlighted in blue, right? So the sun comes and there is dark. And on that day, on verse 18, and on that, in that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river. That's the Euphrates, right? The river Euphrates. And um, he talks about other nations there. Let's go to, to chapter, uh, chapter 16. And Sarai, the wife of Abraham, did not give birth. And she had the Egyptian servant, maidservant. 
And her name was Hagar. In English, Hagar? How do you say that? Hagar? Hagar? What? Hagar. Okay. Hagar in Hebrew. And Sarai said to Abram, Look, uh, behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing, bearing a child, right? Uh, okay, I beg you, go in to my maid, and it may be that I may obtain children by her. So it was considered to be mine, even though she will give birth to you. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah, Sarai. And so she took the Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, and after 10 years, we can ask her name, after 10 years of their being with Abraham in the land of Canaan, after they've been 10 years in Canaan, and she gave, him, gave her to Abraham as a wife, as a wife. Isha, to Abraham, look, the word Isha appearing here twice. It's kind of interesting if you look at the Hebrew. But one time, Isha, with the, the first one, it means her husband, her Ish. Ish is a man, and the word, so look, twice the word Isha. Once is, I don't know if you can hear the difference. Isha and Isha. You hear the difference? I stressed it. But Isha, the first one means her husband, and Isha means a wife. Most of you cannot hear the difference, only because I kind of yell it, you know. But it's spelled, it's spelled almost the same. Uh, oh, the same, you know. It should be a dot missing there. But anyway... Um, so her husband and wife is the same word in Hebrew. Her husband and the word wife is the same word, isha. But it kind of pronounced a little different. So he gave, he, 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 she gave uh, Hagar to Abram, her husband, as a wife. But in Hebrew it is, Avram isha lo le isha. Okay? Avram lo isha. No, Avram isha lo le isha. Her husband, wife, same word, kind of interesting. That's Hebrew. Okay, and uh, he came to Hagar, and she gave birth, and she was pregnant. And as she became pregnant, she was now thinking aloof about Sarai, her master, right? Uh, she's going to bring a child. Sarah, Sarai did not. So she saw herself like much higher in the eyes of Abram. And uh, Sarai said to Abram, okay, my wrong be upon you. I have given my maid to your bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despited in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and you. She's very upset and bitter. And Abram said to Sarai, well, she's your maid. Take her and do whatever you want. And Sarai says, and she tortured her. And the, he, and the English says, and Sarai dealt hardly with her. Hebrew is te'anea, mean tortured her, you know. You know, jealousy can do really bad stuff to us, right? If we're jealous. It's kind of the, one of the feelings that we all, all pray that, oh, we should not have that. Our life would have been better without jealousy and without hatred, you know, just unknown. I mean, ugh. Why are we jealous? Why? Why? Do we want everything? Do we want to grab? You know, there, a, a, an old rabbi years and years ago said this. Look, we are very possessive. We want to take and grab. And, and the rabbi says, you know, when a person comes to the world, a baby, normally their hands, you know, the fists are clenched like this. And the rabbi said, as though the baby is saying, I'm going to grab everything from here. I'm going to take everything. When the person dies many times, their hands are open. And the rabbi says, you see, God, I have not taken anything from here. It all stays here. I want to grab everything. I did not take anything. It's all here. So, um, he's jealous, okay? And the angel of God finds her on the spring there in the desert on the way to Shur. And Hagar said, um, where, and he said, okay, we remember, Hagar, Shifatzai, and he calls her Hagar, Sarah's ma Sarah's maid. Um, where did you come from, and where will you go? Okay, where, well, what's going on? What are you doing here? And she said, I fled from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of God said to her, uh, go return to the, your mistress and let her torture you and submit yourself under her hand. Okay, 
but it, it a knee he is telling her and get torture under her. Go ahead, do that. And the, the, and here is, she gets a promise too. And the angel of the Lord said to her, "I will multiply your seed exceedingly, that it shall not be counted for multitude." Hmm. Same promise that Abraham got from God. But who is now going to be? Is that the son? Oh, my goodness. Five minutes? No kidding. Okay. All right. I got to stop. So I need to do something. You, you got a sheet there, and it's El Shaddai. Okay, let's, let's, let me wrap that up. Okay, El Shaddai is not... I mean, I need to put a disclaimer that I wrote there. It might sound embarrassing to some of you. Forgive me. It's not me. It's Hebrew. So in many places in the Bible, the word El Shaddai comes up, uh, it, translated as the God Almighty, right? That's what you know about El Shaddai, right? Is that true? El Shaddai, mighty. What? But in truth, the word El Shaddai has nothing but nothing to do with God Almighty. Nothing. The word, remember I told you that every noun in Hebrew is predetermined to be either masculine or feminine, okay? The word Shaddai, and excuse me if I embarrass anyone here, coming from the Hebrew word Shad, which means breast, the woman's breast. And this is an organ of nourishing, nurturing, and fertility. Okay? And you read this article. It's coming from my book, God's Secrets Only Hebrew Can Reveal, 145 revelations that English Bibles have kept in the dark. Okay? God's Secret. That's one of the chapters. So, El Shaddai appears several times in the Bible. Every time in the first four or five times, it's in the reference of fertility, nourishment, and nurturing. So, whoa! What do we get here? Another manifestation of the Almighty of God as the nourishing, the nurturing. You know, this is the God that, okay, it's in our, and I'm not, it's not just a coincidental, it's in our chapter. Let's find it. It's in Genesis 17. It's part of the Torah portion. And Abraham was 90 years and 99 years old. And, Abraham, and God show, showed up to him and said, I am El Shaddai, right? He said, but in English, I am the Almighty God. No, he said, I am the nurturing. I am the feeding. I am the one who has to do with multiplication. So this is like almost, if you want, if you don't want, either way, it's another manifestation, another aspect of God, the, nurse, the nurturing, the nourishing, the fertility. The, and it has some kind of a female connotation. I'm not saying anything here. Don't quote me on that. But it's something that we associate with females, right? So he said, walk before me and be innocent. But how do we know about that? Look at the next verse. And I'll give my covenant between you, and I will what? Multiply you. Who? Who is normally carry the babies here? The women, right? The, the women, the mothers. So in a way, he, this is the reference, and it appears more times in the Bible to be a coincidence. You know, it, the connection between El Shaddai is this. This is the connection. Now, you want to hear something really peculiar before I sum up here? Remember, we said that every noun is predetermined to be masculine and feminine in Hebrew. And we have nothing to do with that, and it's not an opinion. That's a fact. Okay, all the body parts, the human body, that comes in doubles, right? Ears, eyes, legs, kidneys, you name it. Many, 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 many. All of them, all of them, with one exception, are all feminine nouns. You say, Oznaim Gdolot, big ears, Yadaim Yafot, beautiful hands, whatever. You describe them with an adjective or the, you know, it's all feminine. Anything that comes in double human body parts are feminine nouns, with one exception. The only exception of the human body parts that is not feminine, but it's else actually masculine, is the woman's breasts. This is the only masculine noun that comes in double in the Hebrew language. Now go figure 
what is there behind that statement. Check me out. Don't trust one word that I'm telling you. Check it out. Go to professors and other places. But I'm telling you, it's a fact. This is the only body part that comes in double that is, has to do, that is a masculine noun. The woman's breast. The nourishing, the nurturing. You understand, I think, a little bit deeper. The meaning of El Shaddai, the ministry that Pastor Mark here and many good people here are following his excellent, superb teacher, teaching. And Pastor Mark has not chosen, or whomever was involved with that, coincidentally that name. This is a, this is a church, this is a ministry that is nurturing, feeding your hearts, your soul, with information and teaching that are not precedented and they don't have a brother and a sister elsewhere, not in America, not anywhere. Tell it to your friends. Tell it to your relatives. Watch that ministry because the pastor here is the gift to the nations and El Shaddai is the gift to the nation. Hallelujah.